Okay, welcome to lecture 14. Yeah. Uh, ever since we began planting tigers, we have stopped working with fields. Very good. Yes, ever since we began path integrals, we have stopped working with fields. That's true. And next week on Tuesday, we will again start working with fields. So the reason we took this digression is because quantum mechanics of a single point particle is a much simpler system than uh, quantum field. And so trying to create the path integral representation of that has given us lots of experience. What is a path integral and how it's calculated? All that experience will be transported to the case of fields next week. Okay, so I should have probably said this clearly that uh, it's all to build up experience. I did say something which you might have missed uh, some time back, which was that with quantum mechanics of a particle, the path integral doesn't always buy us any advantage. It actually can be harder. For example, we found that the free particle and harmonic oscillator propagators can just be calculated by just doing the uh, operator calculation. You don't need path integrals for that. But field theory is a different story and it turns out that in field theory, a lot of things, uh, physical questions can be answered better using path integrals. So, but before we, you know, a path in, writing a path integral representation involves certain amount of guessing and we would not know what to guess unless we start working with the simpler system. That's why we use this. That's why we are still working with a simple system. Today also I will keep working with a one particle non-relativistic system. And from Tuesday, we'll go to fields, go back to fields. Then everything that we've done about fields will come back. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so we've done a few things with path integrals in quantum mechanics. We've learned how to evaluate them for Gaussian uh, um, Lagrangians or actions. Uh, and we've learned that there are certain ingredients in, uh, in evaluating a path integral, namely a classical action, which you must expand around, and uh, the fluctuation variable, which you must integrate over. And uh, so schematically, I can summarize everything we've done as saying that this quantity in practice is evaluated as this times integral d eta into the minus half eta o eta plus order eta cubed that's the first observation. This I think you know. And this O depends on X classical. The second observation is that order eta cubed can be taken care of by actually evaluating a different um, quantity. So to include Okay, so first of all, let's say that this is already equal to e to the i s classical by h bar. And then this, if we neglect the eta cubed contribution, is determinant minus half of O upon 2 pi. Okay, and then 1 plus higher order. and which is associated to presence of those terms. If those terms are not there, then there's nothing higher order. And in fact, free particle and Gaussian and harmonic oscillator cases, this was the full answer, okay? One is a classical calculation, one is a path integral, but a simple one because it, in, it only involves a Gaussian uh, in the exponent, and so we get a determinant to the minus half. That's what we did. And then to include order eta three and higher, We replace um, integral d eta e to the minus half <coughs> eta o eta by same thing did I start the video recording? I did right. Sometimes I'm scared I'll forget. Yeah. Okay, plus integral j 
pita. Here also there is an integral, I just don't always write it. Yeah. And then uh, differentiate this in j many times to bring down etas. And uh, then I can uh, easily include higher order corrections one by one. Okay. So, this is the set of rules that we have derived for path integrals in quantum mechanics. I hope these rules are very clear. In terms of what is well defined and what is not, S classical is usually well defined. If I have some finite endpoints, then there will be a classical trajectory from one to the other. But there could be more than one solution, and it is very interesting when there is more than one. Uh, classical trajectory. So, in fact, uh, this should be generalized to this i classical and each time for each classical solution, uh, I pick the ith classical solution, I will have this and everything inside here will depend on that classical solution and then if I pick another one, then I will have this other factor and then a path integral for the expansion around that and I will keep doing that and some more. Okay. And uh, this is the part that is relatively easy because it just involves the classical mechanics calculation. This part would not be easy but since it is only we actually do it only up to Gaussian order then it is a determinant and then the difficulty lies only in evaluating the determinant for which one has quite a sophisticated set of mathematics results. Uh, we saw one of them which was the evaluating the harmonic oscillator given the free particle by ratio and we can actually extend that to more general cases and we will try to look at more examples at some point or I will ask you to work them out. Okay. So, this is harder than that but it is still not very hard and this higher order just involves the same calculation that leads to a determinant but it also has a term e to the j. So, this is actually equal to the half eta j sorry eta sorry j o inverse j times the same determinant. This determinant is just same as there was before and here all you need is the inverse of the operator o. All right. So, the ingredients you need are now all in front of you, classical solution, the action evaluated on it, uh, obviously the expansion round that action uh, of the action round the classical solution leading to the operator O, given the operator O you need its determinant and you also need its inverse. And both of them are badly defined if O has 0 eigenvalues because this will vanish, so its minus half power will blow up and this will also blow up, O inverse will not exist. So, zero eigenvalues is an issue, but it is something we are going to postpone. So, that is the complete set story that we have developed so far. And as you will see, uh, this story is exactly as it is in field theory also. The only difference is that the variable will not be x, but a field and everything, all the semi-classical procedure, which will have a classical action, a quadratic term, higher order terms. Uh, this kind of generating function with a source j attached to eta, differentiating in j, getting this thing, inverting o, all the same. It's just the details are different. So that's the, that's to conclude that. Now, what are we going to do today? Is to go off in a slightly different direction, where we won't really introduce any new techniques, but we'll understand something slightly in a different way and for that uh, we are going to talk about imaginary time. There are two different motivations for this imaginary time continuation. Again we are going to do this in quantum mechanics and again it will extend to field theory in quite the same way. One motivation uh, is sort of evident from this. Why is there an I over here? It is because the unitary evolution by the Hamiltonian was e to the i h t hmm? and we were calculating a propagator e to the i h t is unitary. There is an I without that I it is not unitary. Hmm? 
so the i has to be there and that i simply stays in the game until the end and we get e to the i s now we have cheated a bit and uh, several times for example here this o usually has an i in it if you have looked at the notes this o has an i in it so we are really not integrate it looks very nice and gaussian in it d eta e to the minus half eta o eta looks like a beautiful conversion thing but we were simply lying because it uh, uh, o itself contains an ima uh, uh, an imaginary factor i so this is really an oscillatory integral oscillatory integrals are less well defined and they might need a prescription for example you could say well i'll add an artificially or by hand i'll add some positive real part to o and then this will converge then i'll do it and then i'll send that positive part, uh, real part to zero okay you agree that if i add even a very small number epsilon o is an operator so if i add to it epsilon times the identity operator then i'm good because i have d eta e to the minus half eta squared epsilon for any epsilon that's well defined in fact it's not just o it's o plus epsilon and then i'll get that i'll get this answer and in this answer i can take that epsilon away but i have to do that to really make sense of this process okay so supposing i don't want to do that well a simple way out is to say that the time physical time is written as e to the is written as minus i tau and tau is taken to be real so therefore t will be imaginary hmm? so we replace the normal real time by an imaginary one and let's see where we get and what good it is okay now mathematically lot of good things happen the first thing which happens is what we wanted that the propagator u uh, of xf and uh, time t so now the time will be capital tau i'll try to illustrate write it like this the total time of propagation the euclidean one so this uh, capital tau is basically that capital t is minus i capital tau clear right now if i do this then this becomes e to the minus h operator capital tau upon h bar and so i've got the minus that i want it simply came by the fact that i had e to the i h capital t by h bar and then i made this replacement uh sorry i had what sign did i have uh this is not happy what did i do did i have e to the, i had e to the minus yeah, yeah. plus i tau no uh, minus didn't i have e to the minus i h yes. here yes. Yes. then i'm good right no if you have minus then you have to define that as plus because then there will be a net positive no 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 uh this one the original one was plus or minus minus, minus. Ah. minus. then i'm good because now t is minus i tau Okay, so that's one minus, second minus, and i squared is a third minus, and that I'm good. So this is the only thing I was doing wrong. So I had this, and this becomes that under this uh, replacement. What happens to the path integral? We'll see next. We want to know what happens to the starting point, which is this object U. So this becomes what I'll call U E, and I'll call it Euclidean propagator. this is of course a very silly name there's nothing euclidean happening here but when we do this in field theory it will be euclidean because the signature of minkowski space which is plus minus 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 after doing this we'll go to minus 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 which is the same as plus 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 up to an overall sign and so it's the signature of 4d euclidean space so anticipating our field theories will all live in 4d euclidean space after doing this and after introducing a minus sign in the action which i'll show you in a few minutes okay so it's just a word and propagator is also just a word you can't propagate in imaginary time if we could propagate in imaginary time i would propagate from here 
a long imaginary time and reach the end of the semester without teaching any more classes. So you can't do that. Hmm? You might like to do it, but we can't. So there's no actual meaning, physical meaning of imaginary time. It's a device, but the device gives a lot of gifts in return for us doing this. One of which is the better convergence of the path integral. And we see signs that something good will happen from that. Okay. Remember, this is not a Hermitian, this is not a unitary operator anymore. It's actually a Hermitian operator. Quite a different thing. Yes. Uh, th there was real time axis before. Yes. But uh, this is a function u e function. Yes. This is a function. Yes. yes. So how would I know that it is uh, analytic over the whole complex? Yeah. Then? Actually, uh, okay. yeah. So the way we'll know that is if we can evaluate this, because this is the definition of that. Okay, so if we can evaluate this over the whole complex plane, then we can be quite sure that it's analytic. It might have some uh, singularities somewhere, but uh, let's try to evaluate it and see what happens. So that's a good question. Now, uh, doing the steps to get the path integral from this works exactly as before. So, just to avoid confusion, let me emphasize something. This is of course not a propagator, it's not an honest propagator, it doesn't have a physics meaning. But you could have not used these words like u of this and this or Euclidean propagator. You would have said, just for fun, allow me to calculate this quantity in a quantum mechanical theory. Okay, simply the expectation value between xi and xf uh, with this operator uh, inserted, which is a Hermitian operator. That I can certainly do. And it's that quantity that we'll try to uh, map to the path integral. And how will we do it? We'll divide this tau interval into n infinitesimal steps and everything will be the same as before. And the end result will be that this quantity u e of x f uh, tau x i n 0 will be a path integral over e to the minus 1 by h bar s Euclidean of x where s Euclidean of x is the same as, so earlier x was integral of L of x and x dot, right? So now it will be x evaluated at minus i tau and x dot at minus i tau d tau. How do you get this? Well, you simply start with the Lagrangian. You can write it out explicitly, half mx dot squared minus v of x. Nothing much happens to v of x, uh, but the mx dot squared uh, changes sign. Hmm? If you want it explicitly, uh, Lagrangian equals half mx dot squared minus v. Then Lagran Euclidean Lagrangian, the dot is, I think this expression I'm not liking. So let's remove it. It's much better to have a clear example. So L Euclidean is the same thing, but dot is uh, now the derivative in T, but T is then after taking the dot, we replace T with minus I tau. Okay. So it's the same Lagrangian, but evaluated on imaginary time. And now we get minus half M dx by d tau. Squared. Because x dot is related to dx by d tau by an i factor and after the square there is a minus. And there is also a minus v and nothing happened to it. Okay. And S e is, now it was integral dt of L. So this is minus i integral d tau of L e. Okay. And now uh, let's look at the signs. So I put I put this into the old path integral, uh, and I find that uh, mm, 
Hmm. So actually, uh, what I'll do by hand is to, so you see what will happen is that since this Le is completely negative, imagine that this dx d tau, dx d tau squared should be a positive thing. So this is negative. This is negative. If this potential is bounded below, the whole thing is negative definite. But the Se which appears here, I would like it to be positive so that this thing converges. Otherwise, I could write e to the plus Se and then keep reminding you that Se is a negative quantity. Instead of that, we'll simply take it to be a positive quantity. So I'll put a minus here by hand. And now it just becomes this. Okay. So now, uh, yeah, so, Sir, yes. So Se is integral d tau L, right? Yes, it is d integral d tau L. E. Ah, good, good, good. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I did this wrong. That's why I was getting confused. S E. Yeah, good. So S actually is equal to minus I integral d T. So S is equal to integral d T L. This is equal to minus i integral d tau L e. All right. And so if I put this and this thing, I'll define as plus i s u t. So this is the extra minus sign. And the idea is that this original s finally ends up being i times a positive quantity. Is this OK? This is the definition of S. dt is minus i d tau. So this is true. L is same as L e. It's just where I made the substitution t equals minus i tau inside. And finally, uh, it is plus i S e where S e is minus integral. Thank you, uh, Aditya. Yeah. So this is the definition of SE. And in the example, you can see why. Because in this example, LE has got this all these minuses. Those will kill this minus. And so in this example, SE will be a very nice quantity. Integral d tau half mx dot squared plus v of x. Everything is positive. It looks more like a Hamiltonian than a Lagrangian because everything is positive. The kinetic part, the potential part, both are positive. But we shouldn't think of it as a Hamiltonian because it depends on x dot, while a Hamiltonian technically should depend on p. So, uh, oh, this is exciting. Um, I think the video will still work. Yeah. But I don't know how well you can see. It's come back. So this is the quantity that goes up here. Now it's pretty clear from this series of steps, S is I times S E. So when I had the path integral E to the I S, that becomes minus S E. So everything is correct. Hmm? Is that okay? So I think the last two steps are in correct. Tell me, what's wrong? Uh, like integral data value, uh, minus I integral data value is equal to plus I S E. Yes. That and the second, uh, if you multiply with I on both sides. Sorry. What, what, what? Oh, sorry, sorry, I was yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I think this is correct. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is correct. Good. Okay. So very good. So that that's done. And the bottom line of this is that we have a very nice uh, convergent looking path integral. Uh, that. Okay. I, I was going to write where S E is minus D tau. Okay, now once we have that path integral, we can try to evaluate it and let's see what we find. So, for example, if we do the harmonic oscillator, then Le is half mx dot squared plus half m omega squared x squared. Okay. And this I can write 
as um, okay now uh, if I want to evaluate the path integral on this uh, I can simply do it by saying that integral dx e to the minus s e upon h bar is equal to integral dx e to the minus integral d tau and here I have to put x and then my operator which is so I can take an m here maybe here and then x minus del t del tau squared plus omega squared x is this good Yes, so no, SC is positive. LE, no, LE is positive. LE is the minus of the original L continued to imaginary time. And the whole purpose of that minus was that LE should be positive. By the way, one small comment is that uh, in particle physics type of quantum field theory we normally take the signature of space time to be plus minus 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 okay plus for time and minus for space but in gravity it's normal to take it as minus plus 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 it's the same space it's just defined oppositely in that case you won't have to do this extra minus sign it will be built in from the beginning so but in uh, but and in quantum mechanics you don't have a choice it would be silly in quantum mechanics to take the metric as negative for time because it's just one one variable and the natural metric is plus not minus is this okay yeah so s equals to minus le dt yes le is positive no le is negative ah, sorry le is positive yes. now no, le is positive sorry yes yeah. yes, yes so s is positive s c oh sorry sorry oh, sorry sorry <laughs> yeah i screwed that up L S E is equal to integral. No, 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 that that was correct. That was correct. So L E should be negative. Oh, oh, oh! L E is negative. Yes, yeah. minus. Very good. Minus L E is that. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is a real nightmare, and I always screw it up. Yeah, this is yeah, correct. Thank nice. you so much. Yeah. Now everything is correct. L E is negative, and so minus L E is that. So actually, instead of saying that, I would rather say that S E is integral of that. This is what we're actually going to do. Yeah. Good. And then uh, this thing with one integration by parts in d tau uh, will send the d del tau from this x to the other x and we'll get minus del tau squared plus omega squared. And therefore, our operator, and this is equal to, there's a 2 I missed, I think, here. And therefore, this is integral dx e to the minus half x. Oh, x. I hope it's clear that the x in this story is the same as eta, except that I've expanded x around 0. So it's just a trivial example of the usual thing. Hmm? So this, where O, is a nicer operator than before. Namely, it is m by h bar minus del t squared plus omega squared okay or if you really want to write it formally then it's o of tau and tau prime is this thing acting on delta of tau minus tau prime but anyway this is the operator and uh, you see one thing very nice sorry this is delta which is that minus delta squared under good conditions is a positive operator do you know why? Or do you know this? Okay. How, how did you never ask why your Schrodinger equation starts with minus h bar squared over 2m grad squared? Sorry? Energy. Sorry? Energy. That e that comes from. The Hamiltonian is minus h, uh, h bar squared over 2m del squared plus v of x, right? Mm -hmm. So why is that sign minus and not plus? 
something. Exactly. Like momentum P is I del by del X. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's positive in that. So that means I del, I del is a positive operator. Okay. If you haven't thought about this, please think about it now. The Hermitian conjugate of I del is I del, not minus I del. Because Hermitian conjugation for an operate, differential operator has two features. One is sending all i's to minus i's and the other is sending del's acting on to the right to those acting to the left, which is an integration by parts. Mm. Okay, That integration by parts gives you a minus sign and i going to minus i gives you another minus sign. That's why i del is positive. Another way to see it is that the best, the good wave functions on which del by del x normally acts are the e to the i k x. So if I act del by del x on that, I get an imaginary answer i k. But if I act i del by del x, then I get a real answer plus or minus k. If I square that, then it's positive. Okay. Now you may argue conversely, why don't I consider wave functions like e to the k x instead of e to the i k x? I don't know if you have ever thought about this. I, because they blow up exactly they'll never be normalizable e to the i k x also is just barely normalizable if we stretch our idea of normalization to delta function normalization but e to the plus or minus k x in infinite space doesn't have much hope if it's finite space with boundaries all these rules change but all we are saying is that minus del squared is a good operator if you remember the corresponding o without going to euclidean time had actually del squared plus omega squared. I don't know if you remember that. And we worried that what if omega is exactly equal to one of the eigenvalues of this del squared, and then it will become zero, and then we'll have a zero determinant. Well, that can't happen anymore. So this operator is non is positive for omega not equal to zero. So we're very happy. There's no zero eigenvalue in this problem. This is one more example of something good which happened by doing Euclidean continuation. Yes. Uh, why didn't we bother about taking a classical path and then using? Because our, uh, uh, yeah, we should have, we should have. I was just lazy. Um, uh, well, it's, you know, it's a Gaussian. So if you, in your mind, just replace x by eta everywhere. So that step where we did a integration by parts to get minus eta yeah. square x, yeah. that in the previous case where we just used the variation eta, yeah. that integration. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So what in my mind I was doing all this where x is actually eta. Okay. It's just, you know, sometimes we don't write out everything. So this x in my mind started and ended at the same point. So therefore there was no boundary term. Otherwise there's a boundary term. It won't kill anyone to write down the boundary term explicitly. Apart from that, this will all be true also. Hmm? So sometimes when we do these things, we just uh, skip the fine print. But the fine print is that it should be eta, which we are doing this on. And then we can do the integration and we can get our operator and the operator is positive. But it's really nice that the operator is positive. Sir, yes. Uh, in the, when we did this without the imaginary time, we had the condition, like you said, that it could be zero exactly. Yeah. And then we said that uh, the it is sufficiently general so that it does not have a yeah. resonance condition. Yeah, we just... So yeah. Where does it disappear when we... It just disappears altogether. It doesn't go anywhere. Like that resonance condition cannot happen here. How yeah. does that entire space... Well, we are doing something different now. We are not calculating that quantity. Probably if we think hard enough, there's a physical meaning to that zero. But uh, in Euclidean, there just that zero isn't there. Let's think about it more. If you come by sometime, we can talk about it and see if we can figure out why there should be a zero at all for some omega and what would it mean for that system. As you called it a resonant condition, probably that's what it is. But you can't have those things in a, in a system where the time is imaginary and there are no oscillations of anything. So it, somehow it's better. Okay. Now there are various things you can do which are extremely straightforward and in the notes. Uh, but I would rather like to now show you an application of this imaginary time formalism, which is really striking. And... In some sense, it's what we always use the imaginary time formalism for, and we'll use it in field theory also. And we'll actually, if I finish this section, 
be able to do a physics calculation of a physical system and get a physical answer despite the fact that we are in unphysical kind of time. For this, I am going to consider a new, a slight variation of my original quantity uh, in which I will take the original and final point to be the same. Here it is not the fluctuation, it is in the original problem, I am taking the initial and final point to be the same, okay, and I am going to call it x0. So this path integral is from x0 and I am going to of course calculate this quantity uh, and I am going to integrate it over x0. So there is a slight twist on the original thing. The original thing was first of all not in imaginary time but in real time and it had an xi and an xf. Of course, I could set them equal, but I never thought of integrating over the common value. So now I have integrated over the common value, then it is a quantity which describes the imaginary time version of a particle that starts somewhere, describes a path and comes back to its original point and then summed over all possible starting points. Hmm? That's what it is and you may say I am being very silly uh, to do this, but actually something very nice happens, which is the following. Since this, uh, this is a position space eigenfunction with eigenvalue x0, so is this with the same x0, x0 is continuous and I am uh, integrating over it. So actually what I have done is to take the trace of this operator. And so this is trace of e to the minus h t h bar. Let's try to understand why it's the trace. Well, the trace of an operator, any operator, let's not call it O, yeah, we could call it O, is by definition the sum over n, n, O, n. This is also the definition of a where n is a complete, any complete set of states. It is also the definition of trace of a matrix. Take the diagonal matrix element and sum over all terms in the diagonal and you get the trace. For an operator, you want to do the same thing. Operator is also like a matrix. Okay? And you take a complete basis of states and sum over it and then you get again the trace. Now in this notation, n uh, it looks discrete and I put a discrete sum. And that will work, for example, if the operator O has a discrete spectrum, then I can do this. And for example, if O is the Hamiltonian or exponential of Hamiltonian, then these could be energy eigenstates very conveniently, which makes it easy to evaluate the trace. Okay? But this quantity is completely independent of what complete set of states I use. So I can use any other complete set of states, for example, position eigenstates and that is what I have done. So it is the trace. Sir, yes. The partial trace, right? Why? It is a full trace. Sir, like we are not integrating over time and uh, like if if we imagine the operator to be a 4 cross 4 uh, matrix. Yes. Because like 4 space. Right? No, no, no. It has nothing. It is not a 4 cross 4 matrix. It is an operator in infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Did your quantum mechanics, you have had two quantum mechanics yes, courses, sir, did sir, Hilbert space not feature? Sir, but we are not integrating over time, right? That doesn't make a difference. No, it doesn't make, a, in fact, it would be completely wrong to integrate over time. We have to sum over a complete basis of eigenstates of that operator. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Not eigenstates, sorry. A complete basis of states in that space. Yeah. Which could be the eigenstates of that operator, which is suggested by this notation, if O is the Hamiltonian or any function of the Hamiltonian, uh, but it could also be this, which is the um, complete set of position eigenstates. Okay, so eigenstates of position. So I can just choose a complete basis of anything. I mean, um, yeah, this is part of the formalism of operator formalism of quantum mechanics, which I'm assuming you know. But if you want to refresh your memory on it, then you should look up definition of trace. Uh, textbooks like the one of Kohen Tanuji have very nice little sections explaining small things and this is one of them or you can just look up Wikipedia also. Hmm? So this is a trace and so I have got this. Now the fact that I have got a trace 
is great because on the left side I have something like in fact I have a Euclidean propagator with some special boundary conditions namely same for starting and ending point and integrated but this quantity in the brackets I know how to make a path integral and integrating a path integral in x0 should not be rocket science because path integral is already an infinite dimensional integration so what's one more integration between friends we can just do one more hmm? so there will be a path integral representation of that so we found a path integral representation of this quantity and I'll write it in a second but it should be obvious it should be obvious that there will be a path integral representation for the reason that this one already has it and we just have to integrate it once more over some some parameter on which the path integral depends it basically integrating over the boundary condition of that path integral and there are not two boundary conditions because xf and xr have been set equal there's only one boundary condition and then i integrate over that one okay now why is this good it's good if i want to know this so has anybody felt the need to know this quantity in any quantum mechanical theory Say again. So stat mech. Stat mech, very good. Good. What about stat mech? Partition, partition. partition function. Very good. So in stat mech, the partition function z is trace of e to the minus beta h. Now this is very nice because remember I told you that this Euclidean tau doesn't have any physics meaning, but now we can give it a physics meaning by saying that beta is equal to tau by h bar and beta as you know is 1 by kt now i'm sorry there's there are too many t's in our problem but this t is temperature it won't occur very often so i'll write it as temp hmm? so the partition function of a statistical system is written as trace e to the minus beta h or trace of e to the minus h divided by kt okay and we found a path integral representation for it. Now, this is a quantum mechanical system. So, what do we mean by this trace and what does it have to do with statistical mechanics? Well, what it does, it does two things. First of all, it tells me the distribution of energy, I mean, the probability of finding different energy states given the temperature, you know this. So if the temperature is very high, very uh, low and beta goes to infinity, then uh, only h equals 0 contributes to it. And that's the statement that a system at very low temperature goes down into its ground state. If it's any other temperature other than very low, then the system will populate different states according to Maxwell distribution. And so we'll have a partition function. But of course, this partition function has a even if we, so it has that means it has a finite temperature meaning. Okay, so what we are now doing is quantum mechanics at finite temperature. And the information about that is given by this. And therefore, if we want to know any thermodynamic quantities, uh, then various specific heats and whatever, which are obtained from this by differentiating in beta or by adding chemical potential or whatever you want to do, you can generalize this. And the nice thing is, whatever this quantity is, can be calculated using a path integral. I'll finish writing what is the path integral exactly, but it's pretty obvious that what we found is a path integral way to calculate this quantity. But there's a second benefit, maybe you don't care about the theory at finite temperature, but this quantity z of beta knows the spectrum of the entire theory. Okay, from it I can extract the spectrum. That what is the spectrum? It's the set of energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And how do I do that? Well, trace of e to the minus beta h, I told you already, can be written in terms of any complete set of states. So now I'm going to put the energy eigenstates. So it's going to be summation n e to the minus. Now h evaluated on this n will be en. 
so now it's just this now there's a small uh, problem here which is that each energy eigenstate may correspond to multiple eigenfunctions if there are degeneracies in the problem so if there's a degeneracy then i can't just say this term contributes once to the answer so the correct answer for this is the degeneracy of the nth state times this okay and now it's uh, this is again very standard in statmec and so if i want to know how many states there are of energy 6 or 20 or a million uh, then i can find that out by knowing this function i can always extract every dn okay how would i do it in practice do you know if i want to act, supposing i give you this function as a function of beta how will you find dn look at the form the first thing i can do is take beta to infinity okay all these terms will go away except d0 and d0 hopefully should be one because quantum systems should have a unique ground state okay then i take this and i subtract that contribution d0 now i take the limit uh, beta goes to infinity i'll find d1 is the leading term then i subtract that then i'll find d2 is the leading term and so on so you can find every term and you can actually apply this to simple problems and verify whatever is the degeneracy that you already know you must have done some quantum mechanics problems which have degeneracy and once you know the partition function you can find the degeneracy degeneracies and of course you can also find all the energy eigen values okay this is good so therefore what's the path integral representation of the trace so to summarize what we learned from this the trace of e to the minus beta h is equal to so this looks very boring we seem to be writing the same formula over and over again but only thing is in this measure we have to say what paths we are integrating over so this is now the measure over paths that start and end at x 0 and then integrated over x 0 and this whole statement is the same as saying over all periodic paths nothing more than that simpler way to put it in words if i sum something over all periodic paths it means i must fix a starting point then do the path integral over all paths which start there and end there and then integrate over that starting point that's all periodic paths yes so for doing this we didn't have to go to the imaginary side we actually did otherwise we would have got trace of e to the i beta h and some authors actually use that but trace of i beta h is not what we are normally taught uh, to be the partition function you could then uh, say that i'll work at imaginary temperature but somewhere or the other something has to be imaginary and it's much better to actually continue the point is that uh, in this formula you don't really have to assume that i ever started with real time this is a self contained formula where everything is real in the formula and there are no real or imaginary times in fact this is a statistical representation of the partition function and if i am not mistaken was discovered independently of feynman's path integral so this integral sometimes goes by the name of feynman katz path, path integral where katz mark katz was the person who this is not the katz of katz moody algebra if you have heard of that this is mark katz and i think he independently i should check the history but i think he independently came to this you don't even have to invoke anything that we invoked on the way you but what is convenient is in our quote unquote derivation of this we used all these operations like inserting complete sets of states and all that and that makes sense in the quantum context 
So we leaned on quantum mechanics a bit, but you can also argue that this trace is just equal to that. And you could also put back an I on both sides if you felt like. Ah, one more thing. So what is S here? S E is now integral over um, uh, D tau of L E with that minus sign over what? From 0 to uh, T tau capital by H bar. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Because that's the meaning of beta, right? We just identified beta with tau by h bar. Didn't we? Sorry. Oh, why the uh, why? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I meant. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I meant h bar beta. This is actual value of tau because it's a tau integral, but that is h bar times beta. Yeah. Yes. So up till now we have not like all of this formalism is for. A one particle in a yes. Hamiltonian. Yes. One particle system, everything. And what you'll find is that next week in three lectures, we'll be able to finish off all field theories in the same formulation except gauge theory. And why will we not be able to do gauge theory? Because of gauge invariance and gauge fixing. That will complicate our life uh, so much that it will come after the mid -sem. But in three lectures of next week, if all goes well, We'll just rerun everything. In fact, you can do it yourself. Just sit in a quiet room with the notes up to this point and redo everything for field theory. And you'll see that there's, there's obviously something to be done, but it's not a whole lot. But the interpretation is always different, of course. In field, we'll discuss the interpretation next week. Yeah. Uh, so if, uh, as to the last question, if this formalism is for a single particle, yeah. then why are we interested in relating it to quantities like temperature? Uh, oh, it's just an ensemble, right? I mean, a temp even in a finite temperature system, when I write about the, what does it mean to write the Hamiltonian of a system at finite temperature? The, it's a one particle Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does it mean to put that system at finite temperature? It just means what I've written, nothing more. You could generalize it to n-body interaction, interacting particles and so on. But for example, I don't know, consider a free non-interacting gas, then the path integral just has a, the Hamiltonian is just a one body Hamiltonian for each particle and I can do this. Okay. I mean that all the, the only thing the temperature is really doing here is telling you the Maxwell distribution of the occupied states, which is what it usually does. Okay. Now, a very nice exercise and one which I'm going to leave for you because I have run out of time is to calculate the harmonic oscillator. Um, it's done in the notes, but you could try to do it without the notes. And it is to calculate Z of beta for the harmonic oscillator. There shouldn't be any problem because this is what you have to calculate. You already saw how to calculate this without the last integral, but you calculated it in real time. So in the harmonic oscillator uh, uh, propagator, you have to make the time imaginary by hand, and then uh, you have to integrate over x. So it's quite easy to find that if I make it imaginary by hand, then u harmonic oscillator um, of x f beta h bar x i and 0 later I'll put x f equals x i this will have things like root m omega over 2 pi h bar and if you remember there was sine omega t that will become sine h bar omega beta because t has a sine hyperbolic sine hyperbolic of h bar omega beta. What happened here? Sine omega t, t was replaced by minus i tau. Mm. The minus i made sine into sine hyperbolic and tau is h bar beta from this equation. And so you get this and then you get the exponential factor, which I won't write, but it has a minus sign in front. Earlier it was a phase if you remember. Now it has a minus sign. All good. Okay. 
Now the wonderful thing is that if I simply set uh, xf equals xi equals x0 and integrate, then I get z or beta and I get a shockingly simple answer when the dust settles. It's 1 over 2 sine hyperbolic h bar omega beta by 2. So this whole thing with the exponential, I simply set this and I perform the integral over x0, which is Gaussian. I just do it. Everything cancels except that. So that's the partition function of the harmonic oscillator. In principle, you should recognize it because if you had ever done the harmonic oscillator as a statistical ensemble, that's its partition function. It's a standard formula. But in fact, there's a very nice thing you can do with it. You can write it as e to the minus h bar omega. So you use the definition of a hyperbolic sign and expand the denominator. I think I'm really out of time to get summation e to the minus n h bar omega beta. And so this is equal to that. It's quite easy to show. And from this, you can read off that E n is equal to n plus half h bar omega. Just by comparing it with the summation e to the minus beta E n, with all with the, and all of these have degeneracy 1. Mm -hmm. Well, we always knew that. But what we are seeing now is that we can find the spectrum if somebody miraculously gave us the path integral. So from the path integral, we can deduce the spectrum of the harmonic oscillator. Never went through ladder operators, never went through a quantization, never found the energy eigenstates, never did quantum mechanics. We only did path integral. And the end result of the path integral is the spectrum, quantum spectrum of the harmonic oscillator, which is really amazing. And this is exactly what it's used for. This is why partition functions are good. We can bypass the entire business of quantizing a theory and go straight to its partition function and find out what's, what are the number of states without knowing actually anything about the states. We don't know the shape of the eigenfunctions or anything, but we know that this is the exact energy spectrum. It just we read it off from that. So I'll stop here.